whoever does the will of God is my mother, my brother, and my sister. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Please be seated. All right, this sermon today is entitled, Who is Jesus to Tom Aiken? Um, And it's a two-part series. I only have one Sunday left, so i got to get it all in two Sundays, um, which is a challenge for me. Um, But uh, people have asked me, you know, Pastor, we we like you preach the gospel, but wouldn't it be kind of neat if you shared personally what Jesus means to you? You're always talking about him. So that's what I'm going to do. Who is Jesus to Tom Aiken? It's personal. It's in the uh, genre of witness, which has a kind of a double uh, meaning in our society of Christians. There have been marvelous witnesses who testify to who Jesus is personally. And then there have been, as we know, the sort of manipulative, pat-me-on-the-back kind of witness that uh, is not so helpful. I hope to be the first one, okay? But I tell you and I warn you, these are my personal beliefs and I want to share my heart with you. I've grown to know and love you and I think this is important. So, number one, and by the way, I will not use church speak. I don't like it. And I will not use a lot of theological jargon. This is down to earth from the heart, Tom Aiken, which is the way I like to preach. Jesus is my Lord. He really is. Personally, I will claim Jesus is my Lord. And I don't say that because I'm so smart or insightful or so deep in my spirituality or that I figured it all out and I came to this conclusion. Jesus is my Lord because Jesus has made his imprint on and in my life and I can't get out of it. And I don't want to. I'm just saying it is Jesus' work that causes me to say He is my Lord. And that imprint has stayed with me since I was a kid. Thanks to all kinds of beautiful people who very poignantly and carefully reminded me that Jesus is Lord in their life. And he's Lord of the church. He's actually Lord of the world, though the whole world doesn't know it. When I say Jesus is my Lord, I mean I look to him as my final authority. I've had lots of good mentors, including you, But starting with my childhood, I had great people who mentored me in the faith and showed me the lordship of Jesus the Christ in their lives. But when I say Jesus is my Lord, I mean I have no other lords, including them. And I respect them, but they are not yet my Lord. When I say Jesus is my Lord, I'm talking about my final loyalty belongs to him and not to my beloved mother, and I can hardly say that, or my father, or my sisters and brothers, or many people uh, that were pastors to me and mentors. That loyalty belongs finally, ultimately, to Jesus. No, penultimately, I, I have a lot of loyalty to family members, as you do. But finally, Jesus is my final authority. Um, and that means I no politician... No theologian, much as I love him. No professor, and I've had a bunch of them that I really respect. No colleague or relative gets that loyalty. Only Jesus. He is my Lord. When it comes to difficult decisions I make in life, it will be Jesus' words and insights that I take finally as authority. And I try to do that. Uh, To say Jesus is Lord, and this hurts... (laughs) is to say that Jesus trumps all the books I've ever read. And books are my friends. They really are. But Jesus trumps them, including the Bible. The great collection of 65 books, the history that the Hebrew people wrote about their faith and the history Christians did, and Jesus himself said he trumped them. Or as some one of you said in Bible study, Can you quit using the word Trump and find out another? (laughs) Jesus supersedes them. Jesus rises above even the scripture. Now be careful because it is through the scripture that we come to know so much about the lordship of Jesus, about his intent for the world. But again, it's a compendium of uh, complex 
both agreement and disagreement. And we have to understand, and I've said this in forum, that when we read the Bible, which is the greatest collection of books, let Jesus be your lens. Okay. Uh, my experience as a kid, I just want to share this with you, and I had great pastors who preached Jesus, the Christ, who preached the gospel, the good news of Christ, consistently, stubbornly, wonderfully. And I had three really fine lay mentors. Some of you will be lay mentors for our confirmants, many of whom are here today. Good on you. Take it seriously and joyfully. These mentors were very clear about the importance of confirmation was to learn about Jesus. Lots of nice doctrines, that's fine. But they gave us all, and some of you are aware of this, a red letter version, RSV in those days, of the Bible, which had the words of Jesus in what color? Red. So you're reading along, and oh, I was going to bring it. I still have that Bible from back in 1969, and it's got all kinds of chicken scratches in it, all because the mentor said, write in it. Write all over that Bible. It's not Jesus. Write in it. Well, I want you to learn from your writings. And I look back on that, half of which I can't read. My penmanship is awful. <laughs> but I know I can remember it like I was there, what I was writing from the heart. I'm grateful for that kind of leadership on the part of my mentors. Um, I can, now, I can still see Mr. Ludwig, this marvelous, joyful, uh, jolly man with a stubborn focus and he was one of our confirmation mentors on Jesus. And he said to his class, I can still remember this because I had it in the notes, to call Jesus Lord and Master means there's no other masters in your life, including your sports friends and your parents. And that was the first time I was kind of ajar about things, see? And he said, no, I mean it. He said, you can only have one master. Jesus himself said it, so choose wisely. Mr. Ludwig. Oh, it's just a real interesting character, by the way. Down to earth. Um, later in Luther's Catechism, which we also read secondarily, uh, it's, Luther says it a little bit differently. He says this, Anyone or anything that you give your final allegiance to is your Lord and your Master. Choose wisely, he said. Just like Mr. Ludwig, who knew the Catechism. Here's an example of what I mean. <clears throat> when I say Jesus is my Lord. And what that means is that he is the framework for my life, both in the church and in my spirituality and in the country, in my world. In this country that I love, and I am a patriot, not the way patriot is often used, but I am a patriot. I love this country enough to be critical, hopefully in a gentle and loving but clear way. And I believe right now, among other people and entities and organizations, one of the biggest threats to the church, to our spirituality, and to the country is Christian nationalism, which has very little to do with Christianity and everything to do with a framework for life that makes America the final allegiance, not God. Oh, God is used... <laughs> as a means to get to the real thing, the real agenda. Great, powerful, rich, number one America to dominate the world. This is what it's all about. And I've been reading this stuff, their stuff, their publications, as well as others, for about a decade. It's just been increasing over the years. And it's very subtle in the way that it lures people into its fold and into its ideology because, well, it uses the word Christian without doing anything with Jesus. You have to read a long time to find the word Jesus in there. It's not ultimately about uh, just making uh, America a Christian nation like it ever was, you know, in its beginning. Uh, there were many Christians, but it wasn't just Christians. And pray God it never will be, or we'll lose the sense of what our country was supposed to be for everybody, no exceptions. Which, by the way, was Jesus' words. Well, they don't quote him, ever. 
because they would have to face their own errors. It sounds good, it sounds nice, but it's disingenuous, and it's shamelessly deceiving. Christian nationalism is a framework asserting that civic life must be organized in specific hierarchies, with some people, read white privileged people, at the top. That's what it is. Uh, they don't even try to hide that. It's bold and clear in their writings. Well, sometimes they throw in Jesus as a little rabbit's foot, but they never quote him because he doesn't say what they say. See? To say Jesus is my Lord means I can't help but be constructively critical to speak out against what I see is encroaching fascism. Yes. I don't think that's uh, an overreach. All you have to do is look at history and you see how fascists operate. This would be a Christian fascist nation if that got hold. It would. And there would be new understandings of violence that would be used like we did before in the Christian church. Remember? Uh, remember uh, Hitler used Christianity. Mussolini. Uh, remember the Crusades to develop an empire where the Christians are on top. In contradistinction to all Jesus' teachings about being a servant of all and no violence to other people, just an open, loving invitation. Um, no, it, it privileges white, conservative, uh, neo-evangelical Christians. Uh, and sadly, the way I've been following this, a little over half of the country embraces it at some level with some criticism. Think about 50%. I worry about this. Uh, and I, I should do more than worry, and I do. I write about it. I've gone to a state legislature in Minnesota and talked about it. Um, it's a powerful, evil construct. Now, again, you're hearing Tom Aiken's personal, which is what I'm doing here. Um, by the way, you don't have to agree with everything every pastor says. That's not our job. <laughs> you know, to, to be agreeable with everybody. <laughs> uh, and we can be wrong at times. Well, I don't think I'm wrong in this one. I have a, a profound and deep need to share this with everybody. And I try to do that. Um, Jesus is missing from it. And it's a dangerous ideology because it prefaces white evangelical Christians. It's about as I was trying to do with the children's room, it's about loving your family, yes, but when that love is only for your family, that's what my marvelous friend Augustine said in Curvatus and say, it's love turned only on yourself and your kind. And Luther uh, picked it up from Augustine. He didn't make it up, but he featured it, and he said very clearly, that is the essence of evil when the love, which is a good thing, that we have for people becomes only for your own kind. That's what Christian nationalism is. It's not interested in what Jesus is talking about, just interested in using him as a means for their real agenda. Okay, number two. Uh, Jesus is my savior. And you know what he saves me most of all from? Myself. <laughs> really. All the bonehead schemes I developed as I was growing up that would, in my mind, I thought would save me. Get the right girlfriend. <laughs> really. I thought this. I'm, I'm just opening my soul to you. Uh, for a while there, I thought, if only I could get the right girlfriend, I would be, you know, whole and secure and, yes, saved. Yeah, well, that didn't work. If I just made enough money, uh, the wife I have was not that first girlfriend, just so you know. <laughs> Be Becky's watching online this morning. No, I thought money might save me. I thought family might save me. I love my grandpa and that side of the family especially. I loved them all. Um, intelligence. If only I could prove I was more intelligent than other people. Uh, well, that was uh, not true. Status, if I had status, that would be my salvation. 
But I can tell you from the heart that Jesus has come along time after time and taken the rug right out from underneath all those idols and flipped it up. And I watched him get knocked down. And at first I cried and then I laughed. Yes. It's hilarious when Jesus is your savior. You don't have to pump up all these things and try to make yourself important, see? He saves me from myself. Secondly, he saves me from this idea that my personal traits and gifts and competencies will save me. Well, we all have them, and I have a bunch of idiosyncrasies and so forth. It doesn't save you. They're fun. They're good. They're useful to our Lord and our Savior, but they are not our salvation. They are the means of sharing the great love of God for all the world. No exceptions. Um, Jesus has rescued me from the endless and joyless religion of points. I knew better because I had good pastors. Lutheran pastors are big on it. It ain't points. It's all grace. We all know that. But may I ask and don't answer, is it not true with you that for a little while you flirted with points? On occasion, maybe, even once. Look what I did for God. God must really want to reward me over that girl over there who isn't doing anything for Jesus. It's, we come by it naturally in our culture. It's a transactional culture, and we then adopt that, sadly, I'm speaking about myself here first, in our relationship to God, which has no interest in transactions at all. God comes to us as our Lord, as our Savior. We do not come to him except, as the Catechism says, that the Holy Spirit has called me through the gospel, enlightened me with her gifts, and brought me into faith. It ain't our construction or job. It's God's, and God loves it. He absolutely loves coming to each of us. No points. Christians are pointless people. <laughs> you know what I mean. No, there's two ways of looking at that. <laughs> we have a great point. It's the point that God in Christ has given us to share with the world, not domination, not Christian nationalism, but the love and mercy of God. But we're pointless in that we don't get any points for it. Isn't that marvelous? You don't have to worry about points. Then you don't have to worry about the report card theology that I've told you about. Oh, she gets a B, not quite perfect. Oh, he gets a D. What's he done lately, you know? It is this unconditional, outrageous grace for all of us. When I say Jesus is my Savior, he saves me from this manipulative understanding of the point system before God. Jesus saves me from perfectionism. I don't know about you, but I have been plagued from time to time. <clears throat> you know, perfect husband. Just ask Becky. <laughs> perfect dad. Perfect friend perfect bishop, perfect pastor. It's all baloney. And Jesus has come along and shown me in experience and through others, especially through others, it ain't true. You're not perfect. And the good ones say, Ed, you don't need to be perfect, Tom. You can forget a story time occasionally because you're thinking about something else, whatever it is. We're not asked to be perfect, see? Jesus saves me from the fear of death. My mother, especially on her side of the family, would touch every dead person's hand in the casket at the end of the funeral, and she had us do the same. Well, I've never feared death. Uh, well, I shouldn't say it that way. But I was trained in a way that says death is not the final answer. Jesus saves us by his life, death, and resurrection, and because he was raised, as the scripture says, we shall be raised. Jesus saves me from absolutes. Do you know someone who speaks always absolutely? You know, having to be right all the time. I remember one time when I was at a very important meeting as a bishop, a very large group, about uh, leaving the ELCA. Uh, I mean, the tension was there. Can you imagine? You know, it was over the LGBTQ stuff. You know, and I was there to talk about what all that means and to remind people of the outrageous love of God for all. And uh, there was some sharp exchanges 
I wasn't ready for it. Um, and I, I can't explain this, but my Lord and my Savior, in some fashion, had this little small voice that said, Tom, in the middle of your <clears throat> expounding, remember you're not perfect, and can you just say, I might be wrong? I, I, I heard all this somehow. I can't explain it. I said, I might be wrong. And it was like this big half uh, a ton backpack got lifted off my shoulders. I don't have to be right all the time. And neither do you to do God's work in the world, see? Um, Jesus helps me to be honest about who I am. So he saves me from deception. Coloring the facts here and there a little bit to make myself look better. No. We can be honest about our country, ourselves, our parents, our teachers. We can be honest because we are covered by God's grace, Jesus' lordship of our lives, Jesus saving us by grace. Jesus saves me from having to dominate over others, to lord power over others, which is what the essence of Christian nationalism, by the way. I keep going back to that. You know. um, and Jesus finally saves me from being a Mr. Know-it-all. <laughs> Who is Jesus to Tom Aiken? Two things today, three things next week. Jesus is my Lord, my ultimate go-to for what life is all about, and my master. And Jesus, secondly, is my Savior, savingly mostly from myself. Yesterday is gone, tomorrow is not yet come. Live into your Lord and your Savior's life today. Amen.